Hello, my name is Patrick Midgley, and I'm a visiting assistant professor of theater history at Western Washington University, and I'm also the secretary treasurer of the Eugene O'Neill Society. Beyond the Horizon was Eugene O'Neill's first Broadway success, and it earned him his first Pulitzer Prize. It was written in early 1918, premiered on Broadway in February of 1920, and ran for 111 performances. Horizon marked the beginning of O'Neill's extraordinary record of achievement on Broadway during the 20s. Between 1920 and 1931, O'Neill had 16 new plays produced on Broadway, 11 of which ran for more than 100 performances, and seven of which were selected by Burns Mantle as the best of their season. Of these seven, three won Pulitzers, Beyond the Horizon, Anna Christie, and Strange Interlude. Few, if any, American playwrights have enjoyed a more critically and commercially successful single decade on Broadway than O'Neill did during the 20s. By 1931, George G. Nathan, one of the famous new critics of the 1920s who cemented O'Neill's reputation as a foundational American playwright, could famously opine that, quote, O'Neill, alone and single-handed, waded through the dismal swamplands of American drama bleak, squashy, and oozing, sticky goo, and alone and single-handed bore out of them the water lily that no American had found there before him. We can see this flowery attitude reflected in much scholarship of even the late 20th century. In his 1988 book, Staging O'Neill, The Experimental New Years, 1920 to 1934, Ronald H. Wainscott describes the Broadway premiere of Beyond the Horizon in almost mythical language reminiscent of Nathan's water lily metaphor. He writes, on a cool, brisk Tuesday afternoon in the winter of 1920, the grand drape of the Morosco Theater on West 45th Street rose on a hastily assembled stock exterior, which resembled many other forgettable settings seen on the rounds of jaded New York theater goers and critics. What the audience experienced from 2.20 until, until 5.50 p.m., however, left the settings almost superfluous and marked February 3rd, 1920 as a special day in American theater history. And yes, that was 2.20 until 5.50 p.m., a three and a half hour premiere. Many critics remarked that the opening production suffered from some lengthy scene changes between exterior and interior settings, but it's also true that the play is quite long. In his 1985 book, Broadway, Brooks Atkinson maintained more than 60 years after the premiere that, the, that Beyond the Horizon typified a new American tragedy, which marked, quote, the great divide between the provincial theater of ready-made plays and modern American drama. So modern readers might want to know what's so great about this play. Well, most critics praise Horizon for its balance as it moves between the cramped interior settings and expansive cloud-capped exteriors it similarly moves between scenes of nitty gritty, authentic, prosaic reality and soaring romance and heavy handed symbolism. The play's emotional and intellectual essence has been expressed by various critics as the necessity of being true to oneself, a relatable and relatively timeless idea. And that theme is explored everywhere in the production. Robert, the dreamer is contrasted with Andrew, this hardy son of the soil, but both men are destroyed by their decision to follow other paths, paths which somehow violate who they truly are. As a result of these decisions though, the women undergo an enormous amount of pain and suffering. Ruth suffers the total loss of love and hope. Mrs. Mayo and Mrs. Atkins witness the ruin of their homes and their farms. And even Mary, Ruth and Robert's daughter, and the later name of O'Neill's most famous female character, Mary Tyrone, dies before the play concludes. In a previous video for this series, Beth Winstra talked about how O'Neill's lost plays are enjoyable to watch 
because they're early indicators of the habits and tendencies that O'Neill continued to develop as a playwright. And the same thing is true for Horizon. For example, Robert's illness and his poetic, delicate disposition likely contribute to O'Neill's skillful and refracted self-portrait as Edmund in Long Day's Journey and Tonight. And it's fun to note, O'Neill's descriptor of Robert as having, quote, a touch of the poet in the stage directions manifests quite obviously in his 1942 play of the same name. But some of the more problematic aspects of O'Neill's dramaturgy emerge in this play as well. For example, the play does unavoidably drive home the idea that woman, here expressed in the figure of Ruth, is at least partially, if not wholly to blame for both Robert and Andrew's self-betrayal, even though, as I said previously, it's really the brother's decisions that set in motion all this heartache and pain. More recent scholarship has picked up on these tensions and interpreted the play in new ways. Uh, Dorothy Chansky, in her 2015 book, Kitchen Sink Realisms, sees in Beyond the Horizon a domestic dystopia and asks her readers to consider how female audience members might have responded to the play's premiere in 1920 and its subsequent revival in 1926. Chansky calls her readers' attention to small domestic details, tiny onstage moments, like Robert's fumbling attempts to put his daughter Mary down for a nap, the blazingly hot temperature of the kitchen in which Ruth works for most of the day, and most tellingly of all, of Ruth's silence after she learns that Andrew no longer thinks of her romantically. These small moments, easy to miss on a first or even second read of the play, allow Chansky to persuasively argue an alternative reading of Beyond the Horizon, quote, one in which domesticity itself and not Ruth is the villain, and in which Ruth has been denied agency and fulfillment. Chansky's read of the play, I think, challenges scholars, directors, actors, and most of all, audiences to continue to explore the depths of one of O'Neill's foundational works and glean new insight. The play soars, of course, with romance and idealism, but it's also moored to reality by the harsh facts of life on an American farm in the 1920s. I'm thrilled that the Foundation is continuing its exploration of these early works, and I'm very eager to see the production. <laughs>